start and introduce our guests. I expect some more people will be coming in, but I'm really thrilled to be able to introduce um, Jack Ford to you. Um, his name is undoubtedly familiar to you as an award-winning television journalist. Um, and we have the good fortune of being here because of a certain basketball game last night, which uh, I don't know if he'll work that into his talk or not. But um, he began his career as a prosecutor in New Jersey. He then entered in, into private practice, handled a number of very high-profile cases before he went into um, his television career as a legal analyst for WCBS-TV in New York in 1984. Um, since then, he has built a career in a number of media outlets. You may recognize him from the Nightly News, Dateline, Good Morning America, The Today Show, ESPN, sports reporters, or certainly Court TV. Um, he's uh, won multiple awards, including but not limited to two Emmys, a Peabody, two National Cable Television Awards, and a National Headliner Award. Um, he teaches at, uh, he's taught at Yale and NYU and, and his alma mater Fordham. Uh, and probably most important, in 1999, he was voted People's Mag People Magazine's sexiest news anchor. <laughs> Didn't know that was on that resume. Yeah, I don't know As where a matter it came of fact, from. somehow Kate found that. Um, I, you know, I, I know you guys are here. It's, it's, it's your lunch break, so I'm sort of delighted for you to, to, to drop in at all. I apologize I didn't bring pizzas for you. I probably, probably should have. Um, but it's always nice to, to come and talk to some students. As, as Professor Bartlett said, uh, to combine this with, uh, uh, with what was a spectacular game last night, and I, I don't know if any of you were there, um, but I was up in the television booth actually watching it, and I was saying that when, when all of a sudden Duke went ahead, uh, when Ryan Kelly hit the three, literally the whole thing starts to shake. <laughs> And I'm wondering if this was really the best position for me to be in to watch this. Anyway, I, I thought I'd, I'd talk a little bit with you um, about uh, some high-profile cases. And a couple of them are things that I've covered over the years. And the impact it has on, on all of you, on, on the legal profession. A little bit of the impact it's had on, on media also. And, and my thought would be that as you guys have questions or thoughts, just stick a hand up while we're talking. All right? We'll certainly save some time at the end for anything. But you know, oftentimes, some of these particular cases or situations might lend themselves to a question. So you know, we're sort of an intimate group here. So just stick your hand up, and, and let's talk about it a, a little bit. Uh, you know, the thing that has always fascinated me, um, I, I teach a course, as Professor Bartlett said, and I, I was a Yale undergraduate, graduated back in the, the early 70s, and I've been back for about five years now teaching an undergraduate seminar called Trials of the Century, and it's a collection of, of trials over the last hundred years, you know, and the idea is that in many ways trials provide a snapshot of who we are at the time. It's sort of a prism that we can look through and learn about ourselves. And you know, my, my, my course focuses on things such as celebrity in the courtroom and race in the courtroom, politics in the courtroom, religion in the courtroom, war in the courtroom. And, and they are interesting, really, history lessons. And one of the things I've always fascinated, been fascinated about, especially since I made the transition, I was, I was a lawyer. Um, as Professor Bartlett said, I got out of law school and, and was a prosecutor for a number of years, um, went into private practice and, and just tried cases, tried everything from death penalty cases to antitrust cases, and actually kind of stumbled into television. The way I got into television was that I had been asked by a number of groups to defend the first death penalty case in the, up in the Northeast. This was in the mid-'80s when states were starting to reinstitute the death penalty. Because it was the first of the death penalties, we had enormous uh, media and public interest, and we had cameras in the courtroom. When it was over, I did a whole series of, of interviews. And one of them was with the CBS affiliate in New York City. And, and when I finished the interview, the, um, the news director came out and said, you seem comfortable. Have you done TV before? And I said, well, you know, my football coach at Yale, this was in the 60s, 70s, when the Ivy League was still a, a national power, had a weekly television show on. And I actually helped put myself through law school on Jeopardy. I was on Jeopardy three times. I won a bunch of money to, to <laughs> pay, for, pay for law school. So uh, you know, that had been my television experience up to then. And he said, well, why don't you, you know, come on, come on with us once a week or so, he said, because we're starting to realize that people 
want to know about trials, it, more so than just what a verdict is. They want to know about the details. And when you think about it, historically, people have always been fascinated by trials. You know, you go back to the, the trial of Socrates in 399 BC, you know, the, the people who were, I guess, the predecessors to my profession, apparently they were runners that would come out from the, the trial periodically and announce to the tens of thousands of people who had gathered what was going on inside in terms of, of the trial of Socrates. And if you think courtrooms, where are courthouses always built? They're always built dead center. I don't know if any of you live in any small towns or any county seats, um, but always the courthouses were in the center of the towns, even the big cities, because it was, it was a place where people came to watch and to listen to the great issues of, of their time being played out there. So it, it, we have this fascination for what happens because it's, it's great drama. You know, when we started Court TV, the cable network in 1991, I was one of the original anchors, and we have always said that the, the true reality television was Court TV. Because as opposed to other sort of reality shows that are, that are regardless of what they say, they're still heavily scripted and they're heavily edited. When you are, are showing a trial, it, it's reality in the sense that you don't know what the result is going to be. You know, and that's what lends itself to great drama. Uh, because you have all of the elements of drama. You have conflict, you have uncertainty, ultimately you have some sort of resolution at the end of a trial. Oftentimes resolution that's not satisfying to a lot of people. You know, the elements of the trial can be all the classic elements of drama. You can have, you can have murder and love and hate and sex and death, and all of those things play out. And, and as, as somebody who made his living in a courtroom and has since made his living chronicling what goes on in, in courtrooms, um, for me, I, I, I've always found that certain trials sort of provide, provide defining moments for us. You know, j just like with individuals, we have, all have defining moments. I think professions have defining moments. And some of what I've seen over the years of the last 25 years of, of covering just about every major courtroom case that has taken place is that some of them have helped to define us in many ways, sometimes in ways that we would not like to be defined. You know, just because it, it's an, ac an inaccurate moment doesn't mean it's still not a defining moment for you. And I talk about some of these, these cases because they're things that you should be concerned about because you are about to launch into this profession very soon. And, and it's a profession that carries with it some great majesty, but great difficulties too. A couple of illustrations. Let me talk about a couple of these trials and cases that I think were, were important and, and helped to, again, create sort of the contours of the image of, of the legal profession and, indeed, the media. I go back to when I was in law school, right, 1972 to 1975, and the Watergate hearings were taking place. Right? This is old history for you guys. For us, it's, it's stuff that we lived through, and it was with regard to President Nixon and the allegations of a, of a break-in and then, more significantly, of a, of a cover-up. And what happened during the course of these hearings, and it's kind of difficult for us to imagine nowadays, especially, you know, I covered the Clinton impeachment trial, which was, you know, sort of rampaging partisanship. And this is, I'm an independent, so I'm not coming at this as a Democrat or a Republican. I've always been an independent, but I'm coming at it as a, as a, a journalist. But it's difficult for people nowadays, if you go back and study the Watergate hearings, to realize that Certainly there was partisanship involved, but it wasn't the, the sort of rampaging, destructive partisanship that we see now. There were still elements of, of statesmanship in, in the House and in the Senate in, in the buildup to what would have been an impeachment trial of President Nixon, but was eliminated when he decided to resign. But in, in terms of the legal profession, the, the curious um, consequence of this, there was an enormous spike in the popularity of lawyers. And there was an accompanying enormous spike in the in applications to law schools. And it's, you know, I think people who are law school administrators will tell you that things are cyclical. A lot has to do with the economy, obviously. But what was curious about this was there were so many people involved in the, these hearings, the Watergate hearings, who were lawyers, who were on one side or the other, Democrats, Republicans, uh, acting as kind of prosecutors of President Nixon, acting as def the defenders of President Nixon. But people would look at them and they would see you know, talented, even people that they disagreed with, talented lawyers. And the feeling was, hey, I'd like to be that. And, and one of the consequences, as we said, is, is that you saw this great uptick in people applying to law schools because they could see that even though you know, we're always the, 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 the butt of so many jokes, 
when I first started doing television, I think it was maybe the second or third time I was on the air. And, you know, I was still practicing law, and I'd come in once or twice a week. And we're about to go on the air, and a, a, uh, one of the producers comes up and hands me something, or that has something in her hands. She says, I just thought you'd like to see this. There was a, a, uh, a survey that was done, basically a poll, taking 20 professions and ranking them one through 20, one being the most respected by the, by the public, 20 being the least respected. And she said, I thought you'd probably like to see where your new journalism profession ranks for this. And I said, where? And she said, 19th. And I said, well, you know, I've still got the law. And she said, oh, yeah, 20th. <laughs> and, and, and the reality is that, that people love to make lawyer jokes, and a lot of them are very funny. I had, when I used to host the Today Show on the weekends, I had a producer who literally 30 seconds before we went on the air would tell me a lawyer joke. You know, to try to get me to be sort of, sort of swallowing my laughter as I'm starting the show, um, but it, you know, the reality is, what we learn is in the great crises of anybody's lives, either individuals' lives or institutional lives, the first place they turn to are lawyers. You know, and, and it, historically that has always been the case. So you know, you 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 saw in terms of the the uh, President Nixon and the Watergate hearings, the, the an enhancement of respect for the profession. Now, on the other hand, you saw in the O.J. Simpson trial, um, and I covered that, I was, saw every minute of it, either in the courtroom in Los Angeles or in live feeds that we were getting back in New York, what you saw there, and this is not a reflection on the verdict, because I've said to people from the very beginning, uh, I said, I'm not, I'm not talking about the verdict here. Um, a lot of people disagree with the verdict at the time. Curiously, and with the passage of time and some of the things that O.J. Simpson has done, um, most recent polls show that the vast majority of the public you know, believe that he was guilty. Very different from in 1995 when the, when the jury verdict was returned. But um, what I've said to people is that regardless of the verdict, the trial, I think, was terribly damaging for, for the legal profession. And it's interesting, because I went into it thinking that it, it was going to be a great opportunity. For, how, how many of you remember watching the Simpson verdict at all? All right, so that this is good. I, I, it's sad that I, you know, my course that I teach up at Yale, which includes the, the Simpson, is always seniors. I was asked to teach the course this past fall at NYU, but to, to a group of honors freshmen. So, you know, I'm, not, I'm thinking, well, it's like my seniors, and I ask the question, you know, how many of you, do you remember watching the verdict? And a little hand goes up in the back and says, um, Professor Ford, I was three <laughs> when it happened. And I thought, all right, we, we're sort of moving beyond all of that. But I, I went into the Simpson trial thinking it was going to be a high watermark for the legal profession. Because I had, I had seen Judge Ito, who was the presiding judge, uh, we had covered a case on Court TV where he had presided, and he had done a marvelous job, very complicated and difficult case. Um, the, the prosecutor, Marsha Clark, we had also covered a case that she had tried, and she had done a, a great job with it. Johnny Cochran, who defended O.J. Simpson, who was a very a good personal friend of mine. We had tried cases together, and when I got into television, I would have him on regularly as a, uh, as a guest with me. Barry Sheck, who handled the DNA evidence, was a year ahead of me at Yale, and somebody I had known for years and years. So I looked at this lineup saying, these are great lawyers. And, and no matter what happens here, you know, the, the, the people will walk away from this saying, having confidence and comfort in their justice system. And, and the reality is I could not have been more wrong. I mean, it, 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 it really just sort of deteriorated in, in terms of, of the personalities inside the courtroom that we, ones who were covering the trial, we actually had a pool going on as to who was going to throw the first punch inside of the courtroom amongst the lawyers. Um, but it had such great potential. You know, I remember saying before the trial started, this is a case that is, is going to touch, it is great drama, because it's going to touch on things that we need to look at. Societal issues like spousal abuse and celebrity, the wages of celebrity, the benefits of celebrity, you know, th the, the, the fair and balance of justice, all of those things that were important. And the, the attention that was focused on the O.J. Simpson trial was just enormous. And again, I don't know if you all were old enough to just remember, but Everybody was watching it. The numbers were through the roof in terms of, of spectators. Um, I, I, I tell a story, true story, a little bit humorous, but it, it illustrates the point as to the, the extent of the attention. It's the middle of the trial, and I was going back and forth from LA to New York because at the, the same time I was the chief legal correspondent for NBC News, I was also hosting the Today Show on the weekends. So I'd be in LA for three or four days and, and take a plane back, and be in New York for a couple of days and fly back Sunday night to LA for the trial. So it was one day that I was back in New York and what we were doing at NBC is that um, at the top of every hour, again because there was such extraordinary interest, we do a live two minute 
sort of hit about what was going on in the Simpson trial. And, and I would anchor it when I was in New York, if I wasn't in the courtroom. So we would start at noontime because of the, the time difference. But I was starting every day on the Today Show, talking about what happened in the trial yesterday, what's going to happen in the trial today. So that meant, you know, I was up at 4 in the morning, I was in New York, I'd do the Today Show, and then at 12 I'd be going back on the air. And, and there was, a, NBC was great, they said, go to one of the hotels across the street, take a nap, you know, because you're going to be on until 9 o'clock tonight, um, take a rest, take a nap, then come on back and start doing it. So I check into the, this hotel, and I've been coming there like two or three times a week. And I walk in, and, and um, the, the guy's very nice, and he says, oh, Mr. Ford, we've upgraded you to one of the tower suites. And I said, you know, that's nice, but you really don't have to. I'm only going to be here for a couple of hours. And I said, no, we really really want to, so here you are, you're up on the 47th floor. It becomes important in a moment. So I go up there, taking a nap, and all of a sudden I wake up, there's sort of sirens going on inside the hotel. And I, and I get up, and I look out the window, and I look down, and the entire hotel is surrounded by fire trucks and, and emergency services vehicles. And I pick up the phone, the power is all dead. Open the door in the hallway, and I can see smoke in the hallway. All right, so immediately, the keenly trained legal mind says I should probably leave and get out of here. Now, this is where the fact that I'm now on the 47th floor instead of the room I was originally going to have on the 8th floor because I've got to walk down. So I, I get to the corner staircase and I start heading down. I get to about the 34th floor and I come across two older foreign women who don't speak any English. And they're there with all of their luggage on the landing and they don't know what to do. So finally I'm, I'm able to convince them to come with me as we go down. What I can't convince them to do is to leave their baggage. I'm carrying it all. All right. Now 34 floors down, cursing the guy who was being so kind to me and move, putting me up on the upgrade. So we get, finally get down to the bottom, and there's sort of double doors that open into a courtyard. And it sounds fairly melodramatic, but it's kind of true. So I sort of kick the doors. They swing open. The smoke comes out. Here I come with the two ladies. I'm carrying their bags. An emergency medical service guy comes running up to me. Now, you'd think, his first question is, you know, are you OK? Are the ladies OK? Did you see anybody else out there? Swear to you, comes up and he says to me, what do you think, Mr. Ford, did OJ do it? <laughs> and I remember thinking, this is odd, <laughs> that that's the question on his mind. But it, it, it sort of reflected the, 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 uh, the extraordinary attention that was being paid to this. I mean, you couldn't, those of us who were covering it, you know, you try to get to an airport to get on a plane to get back, and you know, people were always nice about it, but they're just surrounding you, wanted to talk about, about OJ Simpson, because he was, you know, sometimes for younger people, you don't realize what a star he was. You know, he was Michael Jordan way before Michael Jordan, even part, a bigger star than, than Michael Jordan, athletically, and he sort of transcended race. He transcended sports and became, uh, you know, a, a, a different type of a figure. So th there was this fascination with it, and, and it had the potential, I said, to, to be a great teaching tool. And what happened is, a lot of people blame the judge for this, and, and I tend to, I, I think there's some responsibility there, but more so I, I blame the lawyers, because I think they got so caught up in this that they began what I've described as sort of a form of legal bungee jumping, in the sense that they just would go as far as they were going to go until somebody pulled them back, and the judge in the beginning was not pulling them back. So you were having these, each day would start with one lawyer from one side getting up at the podium before the jury was there and complaining about what the other team said you know, on the news last night or to the newspapers here. And then the other one would get up and, and point fingers at, at that. And it, 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 as I said, it deteriorated to this almost silly junior high school name calling inside of the courtroom. And it wasn't until too late that the judge tried to, to reel all of them in. And as a consequence, I, I've always believed that, that what you got was a, an inaccurate picture in the minds of the public as to what happens in a courtroom. I happen to be a, a, a huge proponent of cameras in the courtroom, and it's not because of what I do for a living. I, I, I was that back when I was trying cases. And, and, and curiously, I, I, I originally was not. Um, and I became a convert. I was trying, the, 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 I mentioned the, the first death penalty case in the Northeast, and I was representing a young black man who killed a young white man in a drug deal that went bad. And his, his mother was just a wonderful person. And she was the one who convinced me to allow cameras in our courtroom for that trial because she had said, you know, this is my son's life here, and I know race is going to be an issue, and I want to be sure that this is as open as it can possibly be so that everybody can see how this is playing out because I think that will help me to guarantee a fair trial. And I ended up she was being right because my judge, personal friend, but an enormous pro-prosecution judge. 
I mean, when I was a prosecutor, I loved trying cases in front of him. When I was a defense attorney, it was like, oh, dear Lord, please, don't do this to me. You know? But I saw with the cameras in the courtroom the change in his demeanor. Because when the world is watching, you know, people don't want to appear to be inadequate in some fashion. So there are a whole lot of stories. I don't know what your views on that's going to be a subject for a different discussion. But you know, I, I felt that cameras in the courtroom are, are a virtue. If nothing else, people will better understand what happens. You know, with, with trials, by definition, you're not going to agree with verdict. If everybody agreed, there wouldn't be a need for a trial. And just because you have a trial doesn't mean everybody's mind gets convinced. You know, at the end of a trial, the one side that loses doesn't say, ah, yeah, you, you were right all the time. I don't know what I was thinking. You know, it, it, it doesn't happen. So you're still going to have disagreement. But what I found is, with cameras in the courtroom is at least you had an understanding. So you might disagree with the verdict, but you understand how a jury got there. And that's an enormous value. You know, one of the real problems is people don't have a sense. They don't understand what happens in our courtroom. You know, most people, and you'll find it when you get out there as lawyers, most people never set foot in a courtroom. There's something frightening about it. So that their image of uh, our justice system sadly ends up being Judge Judy. So they think, here's how our American justice system works. You walk inside of a courtroom, some people yell at each other from a podium, a, a, a judge on the bench yells at all of them, they take a commercial break and you come back and justice is taken care of in 20 minutes. You know, and and that's, that's the image that people have of our, our justice system, which is obviously not, nothing close to the majesty of what it's really like. So the Simpson trial has squabbling lawyers and, and, and lawyers doing and saying things that, that are, are just so destructive of the, 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 the profession itself becomes one of these defining moments. And that's what people walk away thinking our justice system is, is all about. You know, many of us at, who, who covered the O.J. Simpson trial also covered the Oklahoma City bombing trial, which was, was in Denver. They moved it out of Oklahoma City. If you remember the Oklahoma City bombing, the Murrah building, the, you know, the, that iconic, iconic image of the front completely sheared off and 186 people dying. And it was, it was a federal case. It was tried in the federal court in Denver. And so many of us who were covering it said, we wish that there were cameras in this courtroom. Because the public would have seen a significant event, obviously, until 9-11, I think the, the, the largest act of terrorism, domestic terrorism on our soil. It certainly need, people needed to know about it. But they would have seen a good and effective trial judge, good prosecutors, good defense attorneys. Again, regardless of what you thought about a verdict, they would have, people would have walked away saying, so that's what the justice system is about. You know, that's where my tax money goes. And, and it would have been the antidote, I think, to the O.J. Simpson trial. So th that could have been a defining moment for us, but because in the federal courts, you know, the, the, the media is so limited, people didn't get a chance to see or, or to learn about it. You know, the, the other thing about the, the O.J. Simpson trials, I think it became this, the springboard for this um, you know, the, the, uh, the sort of cottage industry, if you will, of legal analysts. You know, it, it's, when I started doing it, it was early on and very few people were, were actually doing it. But they would look, this, the stations and the networks would look for people who actually had tried cases. You know, who, if you're going to talk about the Supreme Court, you've done appellate work. If you're going to talk about a death penalty case, you've tried murder cases. The interesting thing about the Simpson trial is it, it sort of became the springboard for anybody getting on the air. And I would see people who realize that, you know, if you show up at the courthouse and you can say something provocative and loud in 20 seconds, whether it's accurate or not, you can get on somebody's air. And, and I remember seeing people commenting on these, these murder trials and I'm saying to myself, I know they've never set foot in a courtroom. And yet here they are you know, you're pontificating saying, well, the prosecution won the case today with this witness, or the defense won the case with this witness. And you know, the first thing you learn if you're a trial lawyer is it's a, it's a series, it's a journey inside of a courtroom where there are ups and downs. And you can't really, usually, you can't identify and crystallize a single moment in saying that's when somebody wins or loses a case. And we saw it, and, and I think in many ways, we saw the continuation of the OJ problems with the Duke Lacrosse case. Um, you know, you're all old enough, I think, to, to remember the, all the facts of this case. I, you know, in covering it, there, were, there are two things that, that, that I think about. And the first is how abom abominably the media handled it. Because now we've gotten into this area of, of uh, opinion-driven media. And, and there's a place for opinion in the news. You know, it, 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 there always has been. 
Um, you know, always have been the editorial pages of the newspapers. And, the, you know, the, the broadcast news, not as much, but, but there's still an, an area for that. But now what we've seen, especially with the growth of, of cable television, you know, I said to people, when, when we covered the first O.J. Simpson trial, there were three networks, basically three networks, a fourth kind of working its way along, and, and CNN. That was it. You know, now you look at the various platforms that you have that cover the law, and, and it's, it's an astonishing number. Uh, many of whom, if you get online, uh, you know, many of whom have, have no real editorial standards, but people can still say, I am covering the, these cases. What you got when you got to the Duke Lacrosse case is you got entirely irresponsible coverage of the case. You know, how many people, I don't know if you ever watched this, I was astonished at how many people in the early stages before you had any idea what the facts were, were already saying, Here's what happened, you know, and these, you know, the, these three students should be expelled from the university. Why, I remember media people saying, why do they need lawyers? What does that mean? If they're asking for lawyers, they must be guilty. This is media folks who you would expect to, to know a little bit better than that. Um, you know, and, and, and I, I remember thinking, well, you know what? There's an expression that says everybody's entitled to their own opinion, but you're not entitled to your own facts. And if, if the facts were not there, how is it that the media could be so sure what the decisions should be in this case? Um, so I thought it was, it was a, a great failing, an enormous failing in terms of the media and media coverage of this. And I, and I think we, we did ourselves no good at all. And what, what has surprised me is so many people who were so sure in the beginning you know, one of the things I think I learned early on about trying cases is you've got to wait till really all of your facts are in before you start giving your summations. And I was sort of fascinated that so many people who were so sure and made these proclamations early on never bothered to apologize for the fact that they ended up not, not being slightly inaccurate. They were completely wrong in terms of their condemnations early on. Um, but the interesting thing about the, the, the legal aspect of this and I'll be curious to think, hear any thoughts that you might have about it. A lot of times people describe the, the Duke Lacrosse case as, as one of the signal failures of the justice system. My perspective on it is a little bit different. I, I think in, in many ways you could look at it as an illustration of, of the strength of the justice system. Because if you think about it, it, it you, know, you had allegations that needed to be investigated. You know, and I've said this to the, the, the family members of the three in, indicted players here when I was covering this. And I said, look, I, I know you're saying your, your sons are, are, are innocent of this, but the fact of the matter is that any prosecutor, given these, the initial allegations, has to investigate this. You, know, you can't simply say, why? Because it's, it's, it's a, a well-to-do university and a collection of white athletes and a black exotic dancer, I'm not even going to look at it. Well, clearly it had to be investigated. But what happened is you had a, ultimately what we've learned, you had a single, was described as a rogue prosecutor who just took this thing rocketing off into a direction it should not have gone. And my sense is that the, the curious irony of all of this is, is it was a single lawyer that damaged the process, but ultimately it was a collection of lawyers that saved the process and allowed the justice system in a fairly tortured manner, but ultimately to do the right thing here. So that, that I've said, I've argued to people, it, it was really in a, in a very strange way, I'll agree, a triumph of the justice system. That we could show that you could get beyond what, what a single, the havoc that a single individual can possibly wreak on the justice system. And have in, enough of levels, enough safeguards, enough safety nets to ultimately come to what everybody has agreed was the correct and, and, and just result. But I, I think when you look at it, I, I, I think there was, you know, th there was a sense in, initially that, once again, here's another illustration of how bad lawyers are. But ultimately, I, I think that it, it sort of resurrected the image of lawyers. I don't think the, the media profession fared as well, and I don't think they will. And I, I think the, the, a, a sad consequence of where we are now, you know, you look at the media at night, the cable networks, and it's, it's, they're finally starting to, to at least admit that these are not news shows, that they're opinion shows. And that, again, that's fine, that as long as people realize that they're opinion shows. Um, but, but one of the side effects of that, one of the difficult side effects for the media has been that people are so driven to come to opinions so quickly 
to drive these shows, that there's a real danger. You know, if you're talking about politics and people want to have those quick opinions, that's fine, because nobody's going to go to jail for it. But when you're talking about the justice system, the idea of these instant opinions without the benefit of any facts is a very frightening prospect, that you could, you could see what could happen based upon all of these opinions. So you look at some of these cases, some of these stories, and, and, and it, it gives you a sense of these defining moments, you know, what, what, what you can come away from as a consequence, what you as, as the legal profession, the, the, the media profession, the consequences of some of these cases can be here. You know, people often say to me, so what, you know, what do we need to do? What, what do we have to do to get that legal profession so that you're not 20th on the list of 1 through 20? And, you know, the answer I give is, is you know, there's always going to be uh, some enmity there that people have for whatever reason, or lawyers, and, and there's some lawyers out there that sadly drive that, 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 that give us the bad reputations that we have. The vast majority are good, honest, hardworking, decent people. As I've said before, it, it, it's a, it, it is a majesty to the justice system and the people that populate it. But, but my feeling is we need more of those defining moments. As I said, the Oklahoma City bombing could have been, was not. But more of those defining moments to make people better understand what it is that we all do out there in the legal profession and what the legal profession does for everybody. Um, and, and sadly, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm concerned that we don't get that opportunity that often. But it's something that you all are going to face, obviously, in, in your futures as lawyers out there. So let's, let's, hopefully you got some, maybe some questions, some things we can talk about, some of the trials, the other high profile trials out there and impacts that they would have or just being a lawyer or, or covering them, even though we didn't feed you pizza today. Yes. How do you feel about trial participants, lawyers, and their interactions with the media outside of the courtroom? Yeah, you know, it, that, a, it, it's a good question. And, and my sense is now that as a, a trial lawyer, part of your job, is managing public relations. You know, I know there are a lot of people who are purists about this and say, you know, you shouldn't be talking to the media, there's no reason to be talking to the media. And the reality is, as having been a prosecutor, I think there's a significant public relations role and function for prosecutors. I think the pu public needs to know why somebody is being indicted so that they understand it's not being, you know, somebody just sort of um, kidnapping the process the way we saw in the Duke lacrosse case. You know, there are obviously parameters, and, and, and people have thought about them very carefully. So, you know, prosecutors can talk about the confines, the four corners of an indictment. Um, of course, what you have sometimes is, is, you know, prosecutors will then just, you know, load all sorts of things into the indictments. You know, I was involved in a mob case once years ago, and, you know, the prosecutor decided they were going to put every nickname that the, the alleged mobsters had in their lives. So the one guy that I had whose name was Louis Montanero, a.k.a. Killer Louie, and I thought, oh, really? You don't have to put that in there, do you, <laughs> for the indictment? But it's, you know, it's the way that you know, prosecutors will sort of load up an indictment and get a little bit more in public relations. Defense attorneys, you know, you're confronted with the, the power of, of, of the system. And you need, at, at some point in time, and with certain parameters, you, you need, if you're going to be defending your client, and you have a defense, you need to be out there with it. You know, at, at, at some point in time, obviously, you, you know, the, the, the system will, uh, will confine what you can be doing and what you can be saying. But you know, I have no problem. When I was trying cases, I used to be disturbed when I would see the next day in a, in a newspaper something that was in quotes. So they're saying, this is what I said. And I knew I didn't say it. I looked at the newspaper and I said, I know those words never came out of my mouth. And it's one of the reasons why I'm such a proponent of cameras in the courtroom, because I realize it's so diff difficult for a reporter to be sitting there with a notepad and a pen and try to be scribbling down you know, the, the, the important moments of a trial. First of all, it involves a self-editing. They're deciding this is important, as opposed to maybe what I think is important as a lawyer, and them trying desperately to write down all of my words or all of the answers of somebody. It, 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 it physically cannot be done which is why I always thought that having, you know, if you have a conversation with the media afterwards to, to make sure you underscore what happened in the courtroom that day that you th think was important, and you're just talking about what happened in the courtroom. So it's not as if you're, you're going beyond that or doing something inappropriately, but maybe explaining it, elaborating on it a little bit, explaining the significance in the great picture of that, and if nothing else, correcting them when, when they were wrong about all of that. You know, the, the, you know the, the, the difficulty about having 
Um, the you, print reporters, obviously, and taking everything down is hard. The problem with, with um, the, the video reporters, they go out, and you're, you're being asked to, to condense eight hours worth of testimony into a maybe one minute and 15 second piece, which again carries its own difficulties. You know, it's them deciding what's more important than, than what the jurors might think are more important. So I, I think there's a real and legitimate public relations function that you have to serve as both a prosecutor and as a defense attorney. And you know, I think the, the, the legal system has done a very good job in trying to, to create the contours of that to give you a sense of how, how you work. Let me get a, show a quick hand. How many of you, if you were judges, how many of you are proponents generally of the notion of cameras in a courtroom, understanding that judges can control them? Certain witnesses turn them off, something else. How many of you are, would call yourself a proponent of cameras in a courtroom? Okay. Others, how many of you definitely not? Okay. It, it's, actually, this is a little bit, I'm, I'm always surprised that the, the numbers usually tend to be either right down the middle or sometimes more people against cameras in the courtroom. Um, and, it, you know, a lot of people, I think a lot of people when you talk with them, when I've talked with people about the O.J. Simpson trial, a lot of people say, oh, it was the cameras, you know, that, that caused all of that. You know, and my response to them is always, look, I, I, I don't come at this, you know, from an impartial position. Clearly, uh, that what I do for a living, cameras are, enhances it. But I said to him, I was in that courtroom, you know, and the camera was like that little thing up on the wall. That was it. It was up in a corner, in one corner of the courtroom. So you weren't talking about sort of, you know, in the old days of cameras in the courtroom where a big li camera literally sitting behind the rail staring at the, the witnesses. And I, I, I said that, you know, at, at some, nobody really re realized that there was a camera there. And, and I said, and what was going on with those, those lawyers was going to happen whether there was a camera or not, just because of the nature of the trial that they were dealing with. Yes? It seems like also with the O.J. Simpson trial, the fact that cameras existed outside the courtroom and the fact that there was so much media attention yeah. tended to shift the focus onto everybody else besides the actual criminality yeah. of the issue. Yeah. Do you think that this happens, that this is just a, an outgrowth of more media attention, or do you think that it's more of just kind of the, the nature of the personality that we're involved it's a, in? A very good question. And the, the short answer is probably some fashion of both. But, you know, your observation was right. I heard people talk about the, the um, in terms of the trial, you know, being a, a, a sideshow or a carnival or a media circus. And what I've said to them is inside of the courtroom, that was untrue. That was the most tightly regulated courtroom I was ever in. Literally, if you, started, if you try to read a newspaper in the midst of some boring stuff, they'd throw you out of the courtroom. If you walked in with you know, a, a, a tic-tac in your mouth, you were out of the courtroom. If you talked to people during the course of the trial, it was, like, it was worse than junior high school. I mean, people were saying, you know, a good friend or a good journalist got thrown out because she forgot to take gum out of her mouth when she walked into the courtroom. So she was banned for the day from the trial. I mean, it was, in some ways, it was really, it was foolishness. Where the circus took place, as you mentioned, outside of the courthouse. It was the most bizarre, I described it as a bizarre bazaar, if you would, that people had stands set up where they were selling T-shirts. You know, one of the, one of the, the, the only thing I brought back from the OJ trial if, if any of you watched it, there was an astonishing number of sidebar conferences. It's like constantly going up there. And if you're sitting there trying to cover something and everybody's up there whispering and huddling and you know, it's very frustrating to you and it showed up, slowed up the flow of the trial, the jurors used to go crazy with it. And somebody started hawking a button with, that had the sidebar and the line through it, you know, the sort of no more kind of stuff. So all the journalists loved those. That's what we all took back. But outside of the courthouse, it was indeed a circus. You know, you'd show up in the morning and there would be hundreds, sometimes thousands of people there. As I said, people were setting up shop and stands and selling things. Across the street was what was called Camp OJ, which was where all the media and the satellite trucks were located and these huge high platforms built up. But to get into the courthouse, you had to sort of run a gauntlet. You know, and there's security people there. And it was like, I, I said to people, you know, I've covered the Oscars, I've covered the Emmys before, and I was sort of out there on the red carpet feeling kind of foolish. And, and, and I said the OJ trial was kind of like that. Because first of all, the prosecutors would show up and they'd come walking in and there'd be a round of applause from the pro-prosecution people. And then the defense attorneys would pull up in their car and then people would start to shout and cheer as they would walk in. You know, the media would come in and if people liked what you were reporting, you know, they were fine. If they didn't, they'd get in your face about stuff. Then you'd have two different groups would start going after each other. It was indeed a circus outside. 
but it's a consequence of, of a free society. You know, if, if free speech has to, has to mean free speech even, even if it's a sort of problematic in the sense of why are we doing this outside of what should be a fairly somber event inside of a courtroom. So I, I think you're right, it was, you know, I've often said that the Simpson trial was, it's an aberration. Again, I'm not talking about the verdict, you know, because some people agree with it, some people disagree with it, but the way it played out, and I said it was just this strange confluence of time and place and personalities. You know, you're on the heels of the Rodney King case and the riots that took place in Los Angeles. You, you, you have this enormously popular figure, O.J. Simpson, at the center of all this. You have the Bronco chase, you know, which, which took over the, the media. And if you remember the O.J. Simpson, the slow speed Bronco chase where he's in the car and they're doing 40 miles an hour down the LA freeways and it, it, it's turned it into, you know, people are now lining the sides of the roads cheering as as it goes by. You know, I was on the air, we were, I was with NBC at the time, we were airing the NBA Finals, and in a little box in the NBA Finals are Tom Brokaw and me as we're sort of chronicling the, the, the Bronco chase. It was, it was Kafka-esque in, in terms of the coverage here. So I, I've often said that, uh, uh, you know, you don't want to use an aberrational case as a foundation for any conclusions. And I think that's what the OJ trial was, yet because of what it was, it's lent people to all sorts of determinations. But I think your observation was right about that, that those combination of things. Yes? I wonder if you'd comment on the Blagojevich uh, trial, starting with maybe Pat Fitzgerald's statement about the indictment and yeah. then whatever else you'd like to I, I, you know. I was surprised about that. If you remember, you know, Pat Fitzgerald was the prosecutor, in case you don't have it, was a special prosecutor appointed to this, had a, a reputation as being a real down the middle, career prosecutor, and a lot of people were astonished, you know, that somebody with that kind of reputation, especially in the federal system, federal system a little tightly, much more tightly regulated than the state courts, you know, to come out and, and be that proactive and that, that overtly partisan even as a prosecutor. Um, but so, so that you had that coming from the prosecutor, you had a, a, a just, you know, I, I, the best way to characterize it is a really strange defendant you know, doing really bizarre things, um, you know, just lobbying desperately to, for some sort of reality, turning his own tri criminal trial into a reality show. Um, you know, that, you don't usually see that in the, in the federal court system. It eventually calmed down a little bit. You know, the judge got control of everybody and, and said, okay, you're not talking anymore, you're not talking anymore, you're not going on a reality show tour. Um, but it, it, it was, you know, it, it was one of those illustrations where you had sort of bigger than life personalities and they brought that with them inside of a, a courtroom. If any of you ever have a chance to, one of the trials I do in my course is the Chicago 7 conspiracy trial. You remember 1968, um, the con Democratic Convention in Chicago uh, in, at the height of the anti-Vietnam War movement and just, it, it, the, the riots are astonishing. I mean, my students, we have videos of this and they can't believe that they're looking at the streets of Chicago much worse than you see in the streets of Cairo now. And this is, you know, our own people beating up our own people. And, um, you know, it, the trial then itself becomes a, a, just a huge circus. Um, Aaron Sorkin, who's the great writer who wrote um, the, the um, Social Network, and also if you're, ever, if you're a fan of The West Wing, uh, ever seen the movie or, or the play before that, A Few Good Men, um, Aaron Sorkin wrote that, and he's, he's a guy I've gotten to know, and he's actually doing now working on a screenplay on the Chicago 7 trial because it's, it, it, it's side, inside of the courtroom. This is a federal courtroom, and you have, you know, the, the groups are, you know, the, the hippies and these other, the, the ADS and all sorts of groups come together for a trial, and you have people singing folk songs from the witness stand and the, the defendants, you know, wearing American flags as their attire and sitting with their feet on the stands and, and, and bags of marijuana being left in the courtroom at the end of the, the, the trial day. I mean, just strange stuff going on. Um, so, it, it, you know, if you think that it doesn't happen in the federal courts, obviously it does. All of that, consequently, their convictions were all thrown out just because it became a circus inside. But it's a great case for you to take a look at and study if you're ever curious about the notion of conduct inside of a courtroom. Anything else before you guys head out of here? I think we should. Thank you very much. Oh, it's, it's my pleasure. Thank you.